tonight we have a very special speaker, uh, Richard Brodsky. Uh, you know, this, this room is probably evenly, evenly divided between maybe those who might not know who he is and those who, who remember, uh, uh, remember Richard Brodsky. Uh, he is a former New York State Assemblyman serving, uh, serving the uh, state legislature for 14 terms. And he's also a former member of the Westchester County Board of Legislators. In the state, in the state assembly, Mr. Brodsky chaired the, the Committee on Environmental Conservation, creating the New York Environmental Protection Fund. He successfully challenged the Indian Point. Just introduce him. Jeff gave me this off the internet. All right. Okay. We wanted a thorough. No, no, wait, 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 wait. All right. Wait, no, come on up. Come on up. Come on up. All right. Uh, he wants the short version. Wait a minute. Oh, no, no, no. Listen, Al, jo Al Jolson, for those of you who remember Al Jolson, he said, he used to have a catchphrase, you ain't heard nothing yet. I was trying to get away from the script and think about how I could introduce him. And those of you who know my, the way my mind works, I thought of two people when I thought of Richard Brodsky. I thought of Richard Ravage. I hope you're complimented. I am. And I thought, I also thought of uh, Saul of Tarsus, I think you know who that is. Too. Saul of Tarsus. Saul of my, Tarsus. My uncle. Uh, okay, your uncle. I didn't know that, by the way. And if you remember, we had Richard Ravage speak in the spring, and Richard Ravage was basically exhorting us, his audience, but also the wider public, to be involved with the issues, to look into the issues. To, he challenged us to think, and he challenged us to act reaching out to your politicians, bothering them, letting them know how you feel, the importance of, of elucidating a vision for the future, how it's important to invest in the future of this great metropolitan area in this state. And I thought of Richard Brodsky in that, in that, uh, in that context. As for Saul of Tarsus, uh, otherwise known as St. Paul, uh, he is known in uh, certain circles as, as being the spokesman for the good fight. And I also thought of Richard Brodsky in that, in that light too. So it is my distinct pre uh, pleasure to introduce um, a unique and valuable resource of Westchester County, if not this great metropolitan area, Mr. Richard Brodsky. Soul of Tarsus. You can go up a million years and never get compared to Saul of Tarsus. Uh, thank you for uh, that kind introduction. Thank you for spending some time with me tonight. I go back with Al 106 years. The Builders Institute is a stable part of the government, governing and political landscape in Westchester County. And I've spoken to the Builders Institute 30 years ago. Um, uh, I'm also blessed by knowing your counsel, Ken Finger, one of the finest lawyers um, I've ever met. <laughs> wait, wait, that's not how he wrote it down on the card. Um, and I did remind me of the... <laughs> I used to chair the Committee on the Environment at a time when the state was enacting the, environment, the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Al warned me, he said, don't talk about secret tonight. So I won't, but I will tell you the first story I told the Builders Institute 30 years ago about SECRA, the State Environmental Review Act. And it goes like this. Moses is taking the people from Egypt. They are fleeing the Egyptian hordes. They run smack up against the Red Sea. And Moses calms the people and prays. And he says, God, please hear our prayer. Part the sea and let the people go. And there's a gathering of clouds and lightning and thunder. And a voice comes and it says, I have good news <laughs> and I have bad news. The good news is I have heard your prayer. I will part the sea and I will let the people go. The bad news is first you have to file an environmental impact statement. It's an okay story, but it's 30 years old. Well, he also told me not to talk about rent regulation, and I accept 
I accept his instruction. I do think it might be useful as a former member of the government and a, a, an active, you can read my blog on HuffPost, I have a column in the Times Union, I'm lawyering, I'm having a great time, but my interest in public affairs is undiminished and I take to heart Al's charge to you to take it seriously, participate and don't be cynical. It isn't what you read about in the newspapers. That being said, I watched the debate last night. I have my prejudices and my points of view, which I'm not going to bore you with. But I thought how close we're coming to a kind of inflection point, a kind of flipping of public attitudes, public, the way the public expresses itself. Now, the first is on economic issues. For 30 years, since the days of Ronald Reagan, when supply-side economics came in, it was an accepted truth of politics and of government that the way out of our economic mess was to cut taxes, reduce the size of government, and, and unshackle the private sector. I don't commend that to you. I don't oppose it. But Democrats and Republicans alike took that position. About four years ago, Paving the way for Donald Trump came Occupy Wall Street. And Occupy Wall Street took a different mega view. They said, the society is being run in the interest of the 1%. Again, I'm not asking you to accept the truth of that. And what I think you're beginning to see is a change in the public. Republicans, Democrats, and dependents away from austerity, and tax cutting to income inequality and the erosion of the middle class. For those of you in the housing industry, you understand better than anybody the pressures of providing what I mean by affordable housing, which is not subsidized housing, but housing people who work in jobs can afford to pay rent on. Now, that becomes an enormously potent challenge if you then attach it to politics. And those 17 folks are looking for votes. And in looking for votes, they have to find ways to explain this to people. So what does Trump do? Who is one shrewd? Did you say schmuck? No, I didn't. <laughs> I don't think he, I, 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 I thought I, I heard schmuck. No, that's the shrewd, shrewd is Yiddish for shrewd. And uh, he, he decided two weeks ago to come out for an end to the carried interest tax treatment of the of hedge fund guys. Donald Trump? Now, again, don't look for the truth, the falsity, the correctness, the incorrectness. That's a signal. Then Jeb Bush said the same thing. And if, if I'm right, there's the change from the broad acceptance of supply side cut taxes to something about the survival of the middle class and, and income inequality is happening, then it's going to affect everybody, including the business community. Now, how does that express itself? Well, it expresses itself first in the Republican Party by over 50% of Republican voters supporting people who have never held public office. It used to be when I would show up to not get the designation of the Builders Institute, I would talk about my record. No one wants to talk about their record. Good, bad, or indifferent. And you know, it may not just be a phenomenon in the Republican Party. How many of you followed the results in the mayoral primary in Mount Vernon last week? Now, wasn't that interesting? You had the incumbent mayor, you had the previous mayor, you had the head of the school board, you had a powerful state senator, and you had this guy who's been on city council for two weeks. 30, excuse me, 38 percent of the vote. African American, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this isn't as easy as it used to be. <coughs> 38 percent of the vote among African American Democratic primary voters who tend to be the most loyal, thank you, the most loyal party 
of, of reliable voters you can find. Well, if it's happening with Donald Trump, Carly Fiorina, and Ben Carson, and it's happening with Richard Thomas, it may be that this change in attitude about policy, economic policy, is beginning to be felt, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat or a Socialist, there is a fundamental dissatisfaction with the political process focus not everybody has always said that but now it's real and what's real about it people don't think the system is working in their interest middle class people and poor people don't mind that the rich do well they just want the opportunity themselves to do as well if you think the system is gained then there is something that you're going to look well outside the norm for the, for the response. I don't care if it's Occupy Wall Street. I don't care if it's the Tea Party. Something is going on that the chattering classes and the political class and the editorial boards, they're missing. And if you're in business, well, you better be conscious of what that could mean for a change in the way the world and the economy functions. What Andrew Cuomo did last week was very interesting. He came out for a $15 minimum wage. Now, it used to be that was viewed as sort of a charitable response to the problem of poor people. He didn't present it as that. He presented it as an economic theory. What's the theory? If you put more dollars in the pockets of working people, they'll spend the money, not supply side, where the investor gets the break, but the average guy gets more money, they spend it, they create economic activity, jobs. Now again, I'm not trying to persuade you it's true. What I'm saying is that you can start seeing the signs of this in every single area of political and economic life. And it's, now for Andrew Cuomo, for those of you who did not read my column in the Times Union, his problem is he's got about 100,000 state workers who make less than the minimum wage, make less than $15 an hour. And so far he's not willing to increase their salaries. So if you, if you like politics as a spectator sport, you can have plenty to watch. But what I'm suggesting is that to an extent, if you're going to continue to provide opportunities in the real estate business and insurance and whatever it is, there's a change going on in the nation, there's a change going on in the state, there's a change going on in Westchester, and for better or worse, um, you should figure out what it means for your business. I think there's going to be more money in the hands of poor and working class people. I don't know who sells to them. I don't know if they're going to make enough money to buy an insurance policy or to rent at $1,500 a month. But it's something worth thinking about. And if you're in the politics end of things, as the Builders Institute has always properly been, it isn't going to be enough to take the traditional positions uh, we're against the, the business, the Chamber of Commerce takes, at least in New York, the Business Council. No increase in the minimum wage, it, k it kills jobs. Voters like the increase in the minimum wage. So we're in, I think, an actual inflection point. And if you look at the Republican debate last night as an expression of that, then I suggest to you, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, expect the truly unexpected over the next 12 months, 14 months. Um, Bernie Sanders is a very interesting, funny, and serious man. Um, Rand Paul isn't as funny, but he's a serious, bright guy. I was terribly impressed by Rand Paul's willingness last night to say, I'm not for sending troops into wars overseas which is not the mantra of the Republican Party. And I was very impressed by Trump and Jeb Bush saying, we're going to have to do something with the carried interest. 
tax change. There's change in the air in ways that I haven't seen since the 60s. Good luck to you in business. Um, Because I, I, I don't think it's a predictable set of outcomes. Let me then conclude. with uh, a little discussion about New York um, and take a position which, if I get two people to shake their heads in agreement with, I'll be pleased. The, the state legislature is not fundamentally corrupt. Yeah, I, I understood the schmuck part. I understood the car part. <laughs> let, let it sit. Um, the, 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 there are corrupt people in it, too many. Not as many as there used to be when Boss Tweed was there. And it's unacceptable. It, they ought to go to jail, as we're seeing happen today for a former colleague of mine. The real problem in Albany is not law breaking, it's legal corruption. It is the hundreds of millions of dollars that flow not into the personal pockets of six petty morons, or 20 petty morons. But it's people like me. When I ran for attorney general, I raised close to $2 million. I didn't raise it from public-spirited benefactors. I raised it from people with an interest in the outcome. If we continue to tolerate that, you will have a set of morons going to jail, as they should. And you will have another set of people where the outcomes of public policy debates are not decided, right or wrong, by anything but who produces the last $150 million for a $4 billion presidential campaign. The real estate industry, as you know, through the LLC loophole, has been a major force in both headlines and in the politics of New York, at least. I encourage you to continue to do that. But I do think that if you're going to, if you want a state that you can do business in without feeling hijacked, and you want a state where the policies reflect what's in the interest of most people. I urge the Builders Institute to think about what its position would be on campaign finance reform. Not that a lot can get done as long as what we call Citizens United is sitting out there. So be prepared for a, a period of instability in politics a change in the economic paradigm and a continuation of the inundation of democratic values by cash. I, I'm not, I, I didn't get out because I, I, I got out because I ran for something else and I didn't win. I had a great time. If any of you ever have the opportunity to serve in public office, do it. It's fun. You meet bright, interesting, and honest people, and you make the world a little different. But if, at the same time, if your business leaders and community leaders adjust to these changes and demand a democratic system that Thomas Jefferson and, 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 and James Madison would recognize, and that's going to take some change. I'd be glad to take questions if there are any. I'm not insulted if they're not. I'm sure we have plenty of questions from our audience. You're going to bring the gavel? And this is together. an unruly group? It's an unruly group. It can be unruly. But, I, uh, but, uh, I, I have one candidate for the gavel, but he's got his hand up. Uh, right. I, I, now listen, these are the ground rules. Yeah. I want you to stand, yeah. enunciate, 
elucidate, identify yourself, and then ask the question. Don't make a, I'm not saying you, I'm saying, by the way, folks, this is not directed towards Gene. Don't get up and make a 50 minute statement, whatever. I'll cut them off if he tries. Right. Go ahead. All right, go ahead, Gene. <laughs> Hi, Gene. Hi, Gene. Hi, Gene. Very last comment. Gene. Uh, identify yourself. Very last comment. Gene DiResta, Pleasantville, New York. Pleasantville, New York. The very last comment you made had to do with campaign reform. Yeah. How do you reconcile the reality of campaign reform with the Supreme Court decision that there is no cap that can be, you know, added? This to me is... It's, it's worse than that. All right, so now you did go there. <laughs> Um, it's worse than that because what the Supreme Court said was a corporation's a person. It's insane. It won't change until the Supreme Court changes and it will be reversed. That being said, there's an honorableness to the fight, even if the law is terribly difficult, that should engage serious people. And although you won't be able to change it for the Senate races, and the presidential races, you could change it for the assembly and senate races. They did it in Connecticut, and it works. So one small step for man, one giant step for mankind. How many people remember that? Yeah. OK. The, 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 don't despair. Never let the bastard see you sweat. But uh, acknowledge that your fundamental point is correct. And that until Citizens United is reversed, the um, America will not look like America. Yes? Jerry Houlihan. Um, you alluded to the, the change in public perception from the supply side of economics, bringing up economics to demand side. Demand side. And that the perception before was that the way to pull this out of e and an economic slump was to supply side and just keep. Uh, don't you think part of the problem is, and I think this is why there's a voice like Bernie Sanders out there, who's a little crazy, but he does make some sense, in that the collapse, although not completely on Wall Street, you know, there was housing, there was the glass key lack, et cetera, et cetera, but the fact that there was no punishment for a lot of what went on, you know, with the credit default swaps, with the, you know, the small fines that some of these guys had to pay where they reached twice that amount. If there was some sort of uh, repercussion or punishment for that, do you think that would change public perception? Yeah. I have never thought that the way to change the world is to send people to jail. I don't think I, punishment changes no. big things. I'm not a supporter of the death penalty. But I think you're right. <laughs> and I think to an extent, what mattered wasn't the punishment, but the convictions. There needed to be a declaration, not that you need to go to jail for 12 years, but that, no, what you did wrong. And that was missing. And if we could find a way to, you know, I, even as, uh, we were talking earlier about the the announcement today of the settlement with GM on the ignition failures doesn't seem anyone's held accountable. Uh, I, I think if, if there is a plea in the electorate, it's for two things. Authenticity, I want someone I believe is who they are, and accountability. I want people to be held accountable for what they do. The British system, you, you screw up, you resign. Our system, you screw up, you hire me as your lawyer. Japanese grew up. Well, let's. So I, I am for accountability, something short of uh, har harakiri. I, you know, I, I take your point, but I think we can find a compromise there. But I, I think you're right. Anybody else? Any other questions? Any other questions? Don't be shy. Step right up. No, 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 no. Let him go. Let him have. Yes. Okay. Now. How do you propose? How do you? Uh, what's your name? What's your name? Karen. Oh, well. I'm from River Edge. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, how do you think that this government is going to change when our representatives don't have any term limits 
And so these are people who are actually voting. I mean, you know, our government is based on like three parts of government, you know, and that's a big chunk right there. And we don't have any term limits. And these what people, would term limits do, in your opinion? Well, it would change. It would change who's there representing us and voting in Congress and, and voting in the Senate and voting on issues for us and being influenced or not influenced by the lobbyists. I actually don't agree with that. Let me explain why. America is a beacon of liberty around the world, not because of our chief executives. Saudi Arabia has a chief executive. Putin is the chief executive of Russia. What Saudi Arabia doesn't have, and what Putin doesn't have, is a functioning legislative body, a check and a balance. Now, what's most interesting about this is I think most people would agree that checks and balances in the legislature is important. Name one legislative body you think works. State Senate, City Council, State Assembly, Congress, the Knesset, the Diet, the Parliament, the UN General Assembly. Everybody hates a legislature. But it is at the essence of what makes democracy function. Now, if you throw people out after six years, it takes you 60 years to learn how to do the job. Democracy or a republic? It call it, because we live in call, a republic. Call, yeah. call it a banana. <laughs> call it what you want. Well, uh, it's, it's a representative system. I understand that. But if you want to change this, very hard argument to make when you're reading in the paper tomorrow that one of my colleagues is off to jail for 14 years. The answer to Albany is not more uh, uh, Andrew Cuomo. It's a more invigorated and active legislative capacity. Term limits hurt that, especially in, a, in an era dominated by media. The, the, the governor has always got a good suit on and a nice tie, and he's got his hair's cut, and he says one thing. So why does the president have like, you know, no term limits either? The, the, executive, the executive branch needs term limits. The legislative branch doesn't. My view, okay. not yours. Uh, and, but, it's, but I've thought about it. And in practice, the, the, this is how America works. Legislative bodies think about things and come up with ideas. Eventually, executive officers steal those ideas and take them as their own. It's, it's, it's a good system. But don't weaken the legislature in order to, as, as a means of strengthening either a Democratic or Republican practice, as you understand it. I beg to differ. If you have people that have been serving terms that are over 60 years, I think they're pretty weakened by now. I think they're like in their 80s already. I mean, at what point are you going to leave? Thank you. Thank you. I'm, not, I'm sorry. No, thank you. No, no. I appreciate it. You know, times change, you know. That's all right. Julie, Julie, I, Julie, Julie, I took Julie, it in the spirit that you meant it. I appreciate it. Uh, any other questions? Well, please uh, give Mr. Brodsky a round of applause. Thank you all very much.